Welcome back, Pathless Peddlers, to another episode of PLP Talks, where we have interesting conversations with interesting bikey people. And if you're new to the series, we've had some awesome guests. We interviewed Ultra Romance, uh, Matt from Crust Bikes, our friend Martina Brimmer from Swift Industries. So really a, a, a fascinating collection of people that are really shaping bike culture today. Uh, we've tended to focus on the bike traveler uh, uh, so far in previous episodes. And today we're going to flip the script and kind of focus on the people at the destinations that we travel through. And uh, these guests I'm super excited about because uh, we've actually worked with them in the past. And in my opinion, I think they're one of the best examples of a bike-friendly hostel. So without further ado, we're going to talk with uh, Jalay and Pat from Spoken Hostel. So thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. Welcome to Mitchell. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, one cool thing about Mitchell is you guys are like right smack in the middle of the uh, Trans Am Trail. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate there. Um, the Trans Am passes by our front door, you know, probably what, 30 feet outside our front door. So uh, so we got pretty lucky with that. Yeah. Cool. And we're right between two passes, so it makes it a great place to just hang out when you get done with one. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, when we started, we didn't. Uh, I mean, this whole thing was Chile's idea, and I'm. I just kind of came along for the ride. But um, <laughs> yeah, when we started, we we actually didn't really. We didn't know much. We're not bicyclists ourselves, and so we're not. You know, it's not like we were out bike touring one season and went, "Oh, Mitchell, that would be cool." <laughs> um, but you know, uh, so we were pretty lucky to find out that the Trans Am goes right by our front door, and that's. That's the majority of our business, I'd say. Yeah. Once I found out that it wasn't a car, it was an exciting prospect. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I think you guys like do the bike hospitality uh, so well. Um, so for people that haven't been to Spoken Hostel, can you kind of describe some of the, the, the nice bike-friendly touches and, and how you have the space arranged? Well, we have it arranged in a couple of private rooms, just really small rooms. But for the most part, it's a dorm setting um, with the great big bunk beds. I don't know if you can see behind us, but that's kind of a uh, an overall oversized bed. And the beds all have curtains so that you have a sense of privacy, um, that you're not just hanging out there in the middle. We have a shower. We have a creek behind us where uh, if you're fishing, you know, a fishing kind of guy, then you yeah. can hang out there or gal. Um, we have a full kitchen. We have minutes before you get into the brewery, you know, as far as walking. I guess you could cycle, but I don't know why you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we also have a, uh, a Selwood Cycles there in Portland, uh, over in Portland, donated a, a really nice park tool uh, bike stand mm-hmm. and a bunch of tools. Um, we just had um, uh, a new uh, bike fix-it station with an industrial type, you know, pump that's uh, attached to that that'll be put up this summer as well and honestly there's just one of the things that Jalay is really good at is just sort of anticipating uh what people might need Mm -hmm. so and that's what we hear a lot when people leave and you know we've got two guest books full of Mm -hmm. comments people feel like when they leave here that that she's thought of everything you know like (laughs) extra eating glasses and flip-flops and just you know, all those, uh, you know, a USB, every bed has a USB charging station. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dry, fresh towels that yeah. you don't have to re <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of little things that would probably, you know, car travelers and other travelers, they appreciate and they think that's really cool. But bike travelers, um, you know, it's really important to them. And, you know, I mean, from the very get go, it's always been bring your bike in. Mm-hmm. Put it at the foot of your bed, you know. Yeah. The, there's, I don't know if you can see, but the, I mean, there's plenty of space around all the beds that you've got stuff. You know, you got places for all your panniers and mm-hmm. just, you know, stretch out all your stuff to dry out because it is Oregon. <laughs> when we visited there, we, I mean, we visited there a couple times, um, you know, just like the really small touches, like you said, like having the USB charger uh, at each bed, you know, that's kind of kind of acknowledging that's how people travel these days. Uh, you know, lots of people like to share their adventures on bikes. So by having something as convenient as that, rather than like searching for, you know, a random outlet and hoping that there's space. Uh, also like another nice touch I love, I know whose idea is this, but it's like the small privacy curtains on the bed. You know, cause like one of the first things when you travel, <laughs> 
the first thing that's is, fine because I felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, and it's cool that it's there if you want to use it or not. But uh, we've certainly had days on the road where we're just tired of being outside. And one of the first things that you give up when you're traveling is privacy. So it's nice to have just that little piece of it. So. Well. Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, Jalay is really good about. And some of the people that have stayed with us that maybe you're seeing this will know that every night during the summer, we have, a, you know, we have an old Dodge van that holds, you know, what, 14 people. And we drive out to the Painted Hills every night because it's, although it's only nine miles away, there's a lot of elevation, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of goat heads, you know, I mean, you know, the little puncture weed. Mm -hmm. And so cyclists, you know, that are traveling across the country, um, you know, they wouldn't make that trip, out, that nine mile, that 18 miles out there and back. And right. so we go out there every night. Well, when we get back, um, we always have ice cream. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's my favorite too. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's kind of funny because what Jalea will do, she'll come upstairs and like close all the curtains and leave one open with a little reading light on so that, you know, if somebody is, doesn't want to be rude and close our curtain and close out the world, it's already kind of done. So people can come up here and just check out mm -hmm. or, or not, you know, because we, you know, we saw that too, where, um, yeah, when you're on the road, there's no privacy. There's no, there's there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> there's no dial down. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I also appreciated was uh, you can make reservations ahead of time, and you leave a little placard uh, for the bed. And what does it say? It says spoken hostel. Yeah. Spoken <laughs> for. I'm gonna grab one. I'll be right back. Yeah. yeah that's I bring, bring our post. <laughs> so we started putting them in May. We started putting them on a post, kind of a little tree, so that I could kind of show people how many people have stayed this year. Let's see if Pat can get that on camera. Yeah. So, yeah, we love to do this because, I mean, honestly, there's just this, uh, there's a certain loss of, um, I don't know, like you guys are out there in the wilderness in <laughs> tough, tough situations. And there's kind of like a, just a loss of home and personal touch. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know how you guys do it, but. <laughs> well, I like you to feel like you're a person when you get here. You're not a cyclist. Mm -hmm. That's what you do, but that's not who you are. And I want to know the who you are part or give you enough space to just say, I don't want you to know who I am. I just want to go to sleep. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, did... so for me, it's, it's the best way that I can be intrusive without being intrusive. <laughs> right. So did you have a, a background in hospitality or is this all like intuitive or you know how, how is it that you can anticipate the needs so well well because i've been a, a person before <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my whole experience with the thing is that you know i've been tired from traveling i've needed a pair of reading glasses i've needed a place to plug in my phone i've had dirty laundry um i wanted a hot shower at the end of the day and I didn't think that I was that much different from anybody else, and certainly anybody that had worked so hard cycling to get to see me. So what I like to think of is just the things that I would want. Mm -hmm. So it is intuitive. I don't have a great big hostel experience. The first time that I ever stayed in a hostel was about a month before we opened in Portland. <laughs> and I said, maybe every hostel does something I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, after we did that, it turned out that it was fine. Uh, I think I thought of the things that were important. So, yeah, was, yeah. And I, excuse me. And you know, Jale has this uh, ability to just kind of anticipate. Anyway, you know, it's a. Uh, um, I'm a planner. She's, she's a, <laughs> and um, and so that just rolled naturally into this. And and this whole thing was just like, yeah, we'd never done anything like this before. Mm -hmm. This wasn't. We didn't have a background in hostilering or whatever. And so when this came about, in fact, it was maybe it was almost easier for us because, you know, we didn't have any any notions of what it should be other mm -hmm. than just kind of the human component yeah. of mm -hmm. how do we how do we take care of people, you know, as best we can with the resources we have. And um and so we didn't know if we were doing it wrong. <laughs> you guys taught us everything we know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys have, been, have done awesome. I mean, you guys won a tourism award. Was that uh, last year? 
Yeah, so for 2016, we won the, uh, uh, which we received it in 2017, the Oregon Oregon Tourism Development Award, which um, which I, I believe someone you may know had a hand in that, and uh, and that was a that was a huge thing. I mean, um, for those that that don't know, um, Spoken Hostel is uh, based in we're based inside of a, an old church building, um, and it's still a church. We still do church on Sunday. Um, the hostel is not like it's not evangelical. It's not. I mean, everyone's welcome. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't, you know, a bike church or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, the fact that a small church in a community of 120 people won the Oregon <laughs> Tourism Board <laughs> was pretty wild. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that that there was a little bit of. Um, there was a little bit of friction about that because there's other people that were like, well, you know, we have a hostel and we're doing this and we're doing that. But I think it was the first time that something weird like this had happened. Like you put beds in church, you know, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Our joke is that everybody knows that people sleep in church all the time anyway. So why not make beds? Beds? <laughs> yeah. So you guys have been uh, open for, for three years. How many guests have you guys hosted? I think we're pretty close to 800 now, yeah. um, which is just a number that tips me over. I came out here to a closed building February 3rd of 2016, so we're almost at a three-year anniversary. And um, I was thinking about it this morning and thinking, I'm going to be talking with Russ, <laughs> who I didn't even know three years ago, and now I consider a friend mm -hmm. about something that I'd never thought of and knew nothing about. It's just a crazy ride. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So how many um, how many guests do you guys remember how many guests you had the first year, and like how what's like the growth pattern been? Has it been fairly consistent or? It's yeah, I mean it's actually been, I'm not gonna say flat. It's definitely going up. We were totally surprised in the first season to have you know what 300 and some guests. Yeah, wow. I insisted that we not do any kind of advertising. That it be like the most covert grand <laughs> opening ever, <laughs> because I knew that I didn't know and I didn't want to fail at stuff really big in front of people. So it's like, well, let's just open the doors and right. then. Uh, the cycling community was just incredible about yeah. lighting us on fire as far as telling each other about us. So that was that was really crazy. So the first year we kind of think it was around 350. Um, yeah, probably then, about 400 this year. Or so it's growing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we and that's the thing is that we're seeing more and more people want to come out and spend the weekend mm -hmm. and and sort of hit the gravel routes around here. You know, that we've got we've got like a, a really good 50 mile gravel grinder route. We've got mixed terrain of a hundred, you know, there's a there's a there's a century route that's all pavement with mm -hmm. tons of elevation mm -hmm. that's a good challenging route. You know, so I mean we have these this great mix of routes and we're seeing people that want to come out and spend a weekend out here. Um, Another thing that really helped us was the Central Oregon Backcountry Explorer route that mm -hmm. Sarah Swallow wrote about mm -hmm. in um, on bikepacking.com, mm -hmm. and that's brought, I mean that's brought a fair amount of people into our community and to stay with us, and um, so it's just things like that. I mean, yeah, we haven't. I mean, I came from an ad agency, and it's really weird not to advertise. <laughs> <laughs> that's so fascinating. That yeah. it's been like largely like uh, word of mouth. That's that's, that's brought people there. So do, do people arrive coming, uh, you know, someone told me about this place and they had to stay there or do they just kind of stumble upon it or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I don't know how many times people will come in and they'll start leafing through the guest book to find the person that, that told them, hey, you gotta stay here, it's so great. Um, <laughs> or they'll look on the world map that we have of all the pins and they'll be like, oh, there's so-and-so, I bet there's a pin in <laughs> New Hampshire or whatever, you know. Right, um, Reykjavik. Reykjavik, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. On the certainly on the Transamerica, <laughs> it's, it's definitely word of mouth. Um, early in the season, there's people that have may have heard of us um, or, you know, the early season writers will find us um, either on mostly on Google Maps, mm -hmm. you know, and then they'll stay with us. Um, and then they tell people along the route going, you know, on their eastbound track. And then 
pretty soon we start seeing westbound riders that are, you know, oh, we heard about you in Colorado or, you know, yeah. I mean, we've heard, we've had people tell us they've heard about us as far away as, as Virginia. You know, yeah. <laughs> I remember a lady came in and she had her bike and she put her bike against a bed and then she hugged me like in this bear hug and she said, I have been waiting to see you since Kentucky. Wow. I thought when somebody handed me a business card that I was like going to be there the next day. I didn't know that you were in Oregon. <laughs> she said, I'm as excited as if I was in Astoria right now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> awesome yeah. yeah so definitely word of mouth has helped a lot um the portland bicycle community mm. has also really helped us a lot um you know uh and it? bend really and bend as well so cool you know, so, there's you, a... so you get more than just like the the people doing the trans am now like people coming specifically to stay there in base camp yeah 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 which is an entirely different cyclist and different kind of person. So that's been really fun to meet different kind of people. Um, I didn't realize that I had lump cyclists into a genre until you guys jumped out of one. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's really exciting now to just meet people and to be able to meet different needs because a person who's cycling the outback is completely different needs mm -hmm. um, when they get here than a person that's been cycling across country. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing, they're not a seasoned by the yeah. time they get here. <laughs> so, it's been fun, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's a lot of fun to meet these different kind of subsets within the cycling uh, world and just kind of see the, and, and I'm a, I'm a consummate gearhead, you know, I love motorcycles and cars and machines and bikes. And so every time something rolls in here, you know, I'm just like, I look at people's setup and see what's different. And, right. um, you know, last year we had a gal that came out from, uh, from, uh, Virginia and she was riding a garage sale Huffy <laughs> and her panniers were, you know, like paint cans and, and, and a little funny Mary Poppins basket on the front. And, you know, people just, it, it's not, I guess it's cool because it's not just, you don't have to go get a really expensive bike. Right. You know, you can if you want, but there's this great variety of people that show up here and, and, and seeing their gear is really cool. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what's um, how are the the needs different from, say, someone that's riding a cross country uh, across the country in the Trans Am as opposed to someone that's doing like Sarah Swallow's loop or like a shorter loop or something? Um, you're both as a, a distance cycler you're both more self-contained and need more all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but if you're right, it probably does. When you're coming out here from Portland or from a local area, you have a tendency to bring a car a mm -hmm. lot of times or enough stuff that you know that you can get back in a car. And when you come from Virginia, um, everything you need is on the bike and it's light. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're buying a lot more food and that means that when you're here, you're not needing to use a refrigerator, but you need to know exactly how many minutes it is to a milkshake, you know. <laughs> 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 and so it's, it's just that different self-contained level that, um, it, I don't know, and I think you bounce back more as a distant cycler, mm -hmm. you know, once you've had a shower and uh, eat, you're... You're ready. You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the interesting thing on the, on the Trans Am cyclists, you know, I mean, you get here and, um, if you're coming from the West, if you're coming from Astoria, when you get to Mitchell, you, you you're almost ready to give up because mm -hmm. you, you know, we tell cyclists all the time. It's like, no, you can't give up until day 15, you <laughs> yeah. know, because people, people don't recognize just how difficult Oregon is. You know, I mean, Oregon's a tough state to cycle through and, especially our international guests, you know, they, they show up and they're like, you know, I've been in Oregon for five days. I'd have gone through three countries by now you know? <laughs> and I'm still in one state and there's all these mountain passes and they're just tired and, yeah. and, and they haven't built up that stamina yet. So you get somebody like that and they kind of have these emotional needs yeah. mm -hmm. that need to be tended mm -hmm. to, Great mm -hmm. point. um, and providing privacy and just a space to just kind of chill out. You know, we have a guitar and a piano. If, you, mm -hmm. if you're musical, you can enjoy that. But anyway, if you're coming from the east, um, 
the interesting thing is people arrive here and they're physically they're in great shape. Um, you know, they they probably could have continued on over another mountain pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Emotionally, it's interesting because so many people are riding the Trans Am um, to kind of find themselves, you know, and what am I going to do with my life and all this kind of stuff. And they get here to Oregon and there's only four or five days left on their trip and they haven't found themselves yet. Right. <laughs> Because, as you know, riding cross country mm-hmm. or riding long distance is like it's mm-hmm. really consuming. So mm-hmm. you don't have time to really think about mm-hmm. those things. So people get here and they're like, "Wow, it's almost the end of my trip. What am I going to do?" And so you have all of those things. But if you're out here, you know, doing Sarah Swallow's loop, um, you know, you're like, "Where's the beer? Where's the music?" <laughs> That's a really good point. You know, <laughs> do you mind if I come back drunk? You know. <laughs> 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 Can I stay in a hammock by the creek? Yes. <laughs> so on one hand, you have people uh, wrestling with existential crisis. And yeah. on the other hand, you have people that are out there for, for a good time. I mean, it's kind of like a, yeah, a, a mini vacation. Yeah. 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 yeah that's so a, it's, it's cool mix. Yeah. That's a fascinating observation because uh, I remember when the uh, Old West Scenic Bikeway first got designated, um, I, we were talking with the owners of uh, Austin House uh, Cafe. Oh and, yeah, uh, yeah, up on the Austin Junction, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they're they're in the similar situation, right? They're on the Trans Am mm-hmm. route, but they're also part of a like three or four day loop. And yeah. I remember we had this whole discussion about well, what's the difference? Um, and one thing that they noted, um, at least economically, like the people in the shorter loop tend tended to spend more, you know, mm-hmm. because they were there strictly for you know it was like a short term vacation, and um, they could you know spend that money. Um, you know, they, they didn't have to like ration it for like three months. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. in some ways the spending habits, uh, were different. Like they would stay indoors, uh, more as opposed to camping all the time because they didn't have to economize, you know, what budget they had. So, well, I, uh, one of the things that, that, um, you know, for, for people that don't know, we operate on a donation basis where, you know, if you show up here and you're living on $5 a day you know, you still have a bed. That's, it is what it is, you know, I mean, and, um, but part of the reason that we stay on donation is that our goal is to, to use this as a, as a means to help our community. And so if we're on a donation basis and you come into town and you've got say 20 bucks to spend, you know, we'd, we'd rather that you spend 15 bucks at the restaurant, um, or at the store or at the pub, and instead of, you know, spending all your money to stay here. Now, that being said, the, the, the average donation per night per bed is about $25 a person. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what we found is that even people that are on long haul travel that are really trying to economize, um, the interesting thing is that they're starting to, to recognize Spoken as a place to, to save up. So they'll save up for five or 10 days along the way so that when they get here, they can make a donation. They can go into town and get a really good meal or hang out at the brew pub or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's a, it's an interesting dynamic that, yeah, you're right. People that are out here on vacation, yeah, they can spend money. Yeah. <laughs> but but even the ones that are it's kind of uh, on a budget, a real tight budget, are they're still, uh, for whatever reason, choosing to spend that money here, which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the hostel is the face of what we're doing but it's not all of the heart of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the heart really is to build the community of Mitchell, to take a town that's lost all its industry. It's lost its logging. It's lost its mining. It's lost a lot of its big ranching and um, give it a sense of place again, you mm-hmm. know, and bring vitality back to Mitchell. That's kind of had an, an ebb for a while. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's been a real depressed place, but even the locals tell us all the time, it's such a difference having the hostel here. Mm-hmm. So it's, for us, it's a win-win. I mean, <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So, so does it, I mean, it sounds like, has a community Mitchell embraced it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I grew up out in the area, but not in Mitchell itself. And so I kind of anticipated a little, ah, we don't need you city folks out here. Mm-hmm. And that was never the case. This town has been so embracing to both Pat and I and the hostel and the church and all of our guests. Um, 
I, I would say that they are as big of an ambassador to the cycling world on a community level as we are on a business level. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting because the um, I think for a long time there was sort of a stigma about cyclists um, through this area, and yeah. when we opened the hostel, it it I don't know it was really weird. It caused more people to more cyclists to stay. And the more they stayed and the more that they interacted with people in the community, the more the perceptions change about who those who the touring cyclists are. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's still there's still things that we got to work out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're still introducing them, the community of cyclists <laughs> yeah. ranchers to each other a little bit. Yeah. And we have I mean, we have issues about road use that we have to contend with. You know, I mean, like uh, this is this is working ranch territory. Um, there are flatbed trucks hauling stock trailers, mm -hmm. and the roads are narrow. And so, you know, when you have a group of cyclists that are riding two and three abreast on a on because back home in France, this would be, <laughs> a, you know, a country road where there wouldn't be anybody. But this is a highway, and so, mm -hmm. you know, a rancher occasionally will stop us at the uh, at the local restaurant and say, you know. Sure, be nice if those guys wouldn't be too abreast on the road, <laughs> or whatever. And mm -hmm. you know, and we have to talk to ranchers too and say, you know, uh, this is a livelihood for for Mitchell, so we need to be, you know, uh, finding some common ground. And right. So there's there's some courtesies that yeah. that would be good, but yeah. but the same guys are the same guys that stop a, an entirely loaded truck and say, hey, there's a broken down cyclist up the road. Right. So yeah. that we yeah. can go get him, you know. <laughs> And there's, there's been there's been uh, times where a rancher has you know it's been pouring down rain, and they they bring somebody in you know like they 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 find two or three cyclists out on that backcountry route and they're like yeah this was pretty bad we went ahead and loaded up their stuff and they bring them here because they know we'll take care of them we'll know we'll take care of them yeah yeah well let's let's touch a little bit on that. Um... You know, like in Oregon, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on, you know, businesses being and communities being bike friendly. What's the other side of the coin? Like how, how can cyclists be like a good guest when they enter, uh, especially like a, a rural area? Like what would be, you know, like two or three things that you'd want them to keep in mind? So one of the things that um, maybe, you know, you and I have touched on probably in the past is that, yeah, this is a rural community and it's a it's a big area. And there's a lot. There's vast wide open where there's no humans but those those properties are still somebody's yard it's still somebody's field it's mm -hmm. still you know it, it seems like it's not that big of a deal but you know when you jump a fence um when you maybe don't look for an outhouse <laughs> you know you don't clean up after yourself you know that that has an impact on uh the people in the rural communities and um and and honestly for the most part, I mean, like 99% of cyclists, you know, they're not going to just like, they're not going to be rude and tear down a fence just to get to a stream to, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they're a very conscientious bunch. But yeah, sometimes it can be, you know, especially back bike packing. Yeah, you are in a solitary mindset. So you don't, you, you kind of forget to think that this may belong to somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's one of the, the things that we've been really conscious about thinking about is that uh you know as a bike traveler you kind of get in this mindset of like i'm on an adventure i'm in the middle of nowhere and you kind of forget like your middle of nowhere is someone's backyard you yeah. know and it, may, it may not look like that but you know the chances are there's someone that you know, kind of tends the land and uh, mm -hmm. one thing we've also realized is uh news travels fast in the middle of nowhere <laughs> it travels yeah. so fast uh we we were on uh, this gravel ride out in hepner and uh yep. The the mud got so thick that I had to hitch a ride out uh, from this random rancher that was passing by, and we were staying with uh, Phil over at uh, his uh, his uh, ranch. And within yeah. that day, he got a call. It's like you know, my cousin's brother's uh, you know uncle you know picked up some cyclists. Is he one of your you know like within the same day? Like in this yeah, in the middle yeah. of nowhere. So like good news <laughs> travels fast, and bad news I think you know tra travels just as fast. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, especially on the backcountry stuff, you know, if if you if you open a gate for any reason, 
close the gate. Close you know, the gate. Every one of those four-footed animals is thousands of dollars of income, and those that income provides income for families around here. So, you know, you leave a gate open, uh, that's a hard, that's for us as a business in a ranching community, that's hard for us to overcome, yeah. you know. Um, crossing people's land, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to go looking for a house, but by and large, you know, if you find a house and, and, you know, you're out of water, people know what it's like to be wa out of water out here. So yeah, you know, make an effort, I guess is, is the, is the point there. And, but then as far as like the community goes, boy, I don't know. I mean, just being a, a, a good guest. Yeah, I think a good guest inside the community is just being polite. I mean, you may not realize it, but if you're wearing biking gear, you're wearing a uniform for all cyclists. Yeah. And yeah. it only takes one jerk to label <laughs> cyclists for a long time in a small community because right. the restaurant that you ate at this morning will probably call and tell that restaurant you want to eat at dinner um, they don't tip, they're really demanding, they're loud, and they leave mud all over your floor. Right. So if you want that to be you and all cyclists, by all means, that's a great <laughs> <Right>. way. <laughs> but on the whole, cyclists are also within our community of Mitchell, the favorite guest, yeah. because you guys are very respectful. Generous. You're generous, good tippers. Um, you have amazing stories yep. to share. Yeah. And you're really good around the campfire at the brewery because you've been places. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we've, we've had to explain to people is this concept of bonking. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we'll get a cyclist in here that's been riding all day long or even for several months, you know, and they're just, they're all up in their head and they just, you know, and they're, they're low on protein and, mm -hmm. and just not doing well. And so sometimes we have to explain to other people, you know, that person is not rude. They, they just have immediate needs that yeah. need to be taken care of. And, you know, and, and it's great because, you know, you, you guys get here and, you know, you're bonked and you're dehydrated and you're <laughs> tired and you're mad because there was a mountain pass and the head. <laughs> and after, you know, some food, a beer, and a shower, suddenly you blossom into these amazing people. <laughs> so true. So, <laughs> to explain to people in town that that's, you know, don't judge everything on just, you know, one person uh, coming in and, and because they'll come back for breakfast and they're a completely different person. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think just be cognizant, be conscious of, of, that, you know, you kind of are setting a, a bit of a standard for everyone else, especially if you come through in the spring. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I feel bad because those guys in the, you know, the writers in the spring, they kind of set the example for everybody all year long. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but the hardiest guys, they are the hardiest. That's yeah. For sure. Yeah. But, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the backcountry explorer route. Uh, cause we got a chance to ride that with the, uh, ramble ride that, uh, stopped yeah. at, at your place. That's a tough route. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had tough weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, the, that particular route, you know, uh, good weather for that route is actually kind of a short window because you go from freezing cold, snow, rain to 104 degrees in a deep canyon and th and thick, heavy gravel. And I mean, we've had a couple of well, we've had more than a couple. We've had several instances where a group of riders will be 15 miles from here, 20 miles from here. They're out of water. They're experienced riders. You know, they're not like me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll, everyone will pool their water and give it to the strongest rider and say, get to Mitchell and find help. And, oh, then, wow. <laughs> you know, we'll take the van or the bus and we'll drive out there and pick everybody up and um, bring them in because they just, it's hard. It can be a hard route. Yeah. Having said that, um, you know, I talked to Sarah Swallow about that and she said that, that, you know, her recommendation was to do it in three to five days, which, you know, I mean, you can do that. You can do it in three days. You guys did it in three days. Yeah. And. <laughs> well, we but had the, we, push. Yeah. But we had the beer garden at the end of each day with a new Belgian. So. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But uh, one thing, the one thing that we found is that um, people that do it in four or five days, I mean, they love it. They have a really good time. They really enjoy themselves. Um it's just a more enjoyable trip on, on four to five days. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do it in three, typically that means we'll pick you, we'll end up picking you up 15 miles before you get to Spoken. 
And then in the morning, we're loading you up and taking you to the top of the Ochoco Pass so you can make it home in time. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And so, if you're really experienced, three days, awesome. Yeah. So, in the summer, water is definitely an issue. And I think that um, I can equate it to finding out that people are shipwrecked. I mean, they're <laughs> completely done in and have no resource left by the time we get to them, which is a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. uh, we started taking some water out and just leaving it on the trail anytime we heard that we, there was a cyclist coming through um, or people that live out in that area would stop in and say, hey, you got cyclists out there. So we'd check on them if we hadn't seen them by six o'clock or something. Yeah. yeah. But that's not a supported route. And honestly, there's a little bit of word getting out there that it is supported and that we're not going to leave you there. But if we don't know about you, we're not going to help you either. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, how, how, how did people usually, where did people usually start that route? Do they start at Start out of Mitchell and make a loop, or do they start out of Prineville? Or uh, they, typically, they start at Good Bike Company in Prineville, yeah. and um, and leave from leave from Prineville and circle back to Prineville, which honestly is is like that's the perfect way to do it. Excuse me, um, because Good Bike Company uh, over James Good and Kristen and those guys over there in Prineville are just they'll get you in top notch ship shape, ready to go. They can give you heads up warnings about certain things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause they write it constantly. Yeah. They know that route. Um, and I, I don't want to discourage people from taking that route because it really is spectacular. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing is it's a developing route and we've talked to ranchers out there that, and, and they've seen cyclists coming through and they're, they're also willing to say, you know, I've talked to two other two of the ranchers out there, and, and they've said, "Yeah, we'll put water coolers out all summer long if that's what it takes." Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you you have the support of the community, right? That's that's building. Um, if we if we had a perfect world scenario, uh, we'd have a hostel in Ashwood, which is where um, uh, where you come in from Prineville on the. If you're doing it in three days, you you would come into Ashwood on day one, but mm -hmm. um, but anyway. It's a great route. It's just mm -hmm. developing. And I think this year uh, we'll probably see more water stops along the way, mm -hmm. uh, which will make it easier. And starting in Prineville is really good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been good for our community, too. Cool. It really has. Yeah, this is like, um, I mean, you guys are kind of on the, the front lines of uh, undiscovered territory in terms of like bikepacking. It's a completely different yeah. beast from paved road riding where there's generally services and it's way easier to hitch a ride. But yeah. with the explosion of bike packing that's going through such remote areas, um, you know, a route that's doable for, you know, say like Sarah Swallow is like maybe something I, I wouldn't be able to do in the, in the same length of time. <laughs> so, you Come know, on, now. You did do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as there's a, a beer garden that I'm good to go. <laughs> but kind of, uh, you know, I, I don't think those challenges of putting up uh, a route out there in the middle of nowhere um, and you know, issues of resupply and like where they get help have been like thoroughly um, addressed yet for, for, for a lot of routes. I mean, like but you yeah. said, this is a developing route. You know, things may change and everything. Uh, but I, one, of, one of the other things that's an issue out here is that um, a lot of people have a hard time conceiving the idea that there are places where there's. I mean, there's hours and hours without cell phone service. I mean, even days without out here in Eastern Oregon. Yeah. And so that that will really take people by surprise because they, they think, OK, well, we'll have spotty reception. No, th there's <laughs> no reception. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. So so that is one of the things that I think that catches people off guard, because, I mean, honestly, we do rely on our cell phones for that that last little bit of hope that, well, if I get into too much trouble, I can always hike a certain distance and call someone and, and that doesn't exist out here. And yeah. so, but I do like bikepacking in the sense that it is opening up a lot of territory mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that people wouldn't normally see. Um, and bike packers are, are courteous and they, you know, yeah. you know, they're explorers. They're good guests. Yeah, they are good guests. Yeah. 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 I think for like an area like, you know, Mitchell and Prineville that are on the Trans Am, it gives another, you know, reason for a different set of cyclists to stay, you know, yeah. for like a weekend, exactly. long weekend and everything. Because you're not just passing through. You could base camp, do these long gravel loops and, you know, actually create like a, a bigger economic impact in, in the region. So. Yeah, we've got, um, like I said earlier, we've got a 50 mile gravel loop. We've got a 100 mile, uh, you know, road surface loop. And then we've got a probably a 60 mile mixed terrain 
you know, gravel and asphalt. Um, you know, so, I mean, if, if, if you're pretty hardy and spent three days out here, you, know, <laughs> you get a lot of riding in and a ton of elevation and you'd see some really spectacular things. In fact, we've had, um, uh, people out here that have, you know, ridden Moab and mm -hmm. all these other amazing places. And they've come out here and ridden to, uh, Twickenham through Black Canyon. And they're just like, this is <laughs> every world bit. Of, yeah. It's world class. It's every world bit as amazing. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And you guys have a, like we chatted with this the other day, you guys have a brewery in town that's just opened up a, a, a legit space. And yeah. uh, you said they're developing a gravel grinder? Yeah, so they're, uh, the, the plan is to do a gravel grinder route. Uh, they're calling it uh, Grinder Hosen because it's during <laughs> Oktoberfest. So as you might imagine, it has something to do with beer. But 50 mile uh, gravel loop that goes up in the Ochoco Mountains just south of us. Um, it leaves from Tigertown Brewery in Mitchell and ends at Tigertown Brewery in Mitchell. And um, so that is uh, that's coming up in I believe it's in September. Um, but that's a that's a brand new thing. I guess uh, head on over you know try and find uh, uh, Tigertown and their Facebook page will have events and things like that. But yeah, they. They've they've wanted to do a bike race or a, a bike route as part of their business model because they understand that um, you know I mean that's for a small town like this that's a great market and yeah. it's and like we say it's a generous market mm -hmm. um, it's not a mm -hmm. it's not just disposable income but it's people who who kind of get it you know what I mean mm -hmm. I feel like most of the cyclists that stay with us and by us I mean Mitchell. Um, I, I feel like they support us, yeah. they, not just with their dollar, and that certainly does, but they want to see Mitchell succeed, and mm -hmm. it's a wonderful feeling. It's a, it's a very family reunion yeah. kind of feeling. You know, people you maybe haven't met before, but you feel connected. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's great when they when, when people get here, they catch the vision, mm -hmm. and they're like, wow, we, you know, how can we help? I mean, we get, you know, we get letters and checks in the mail from people who say, you know, well, I stayed there, you know, last summer and I really like what you guys are doing here. Here's some money, you know, <laughs> right. you know three Christmas cards with people that just said, you know, I felt like we didn't donate the way we wanted to. And here's mm -hmm. something just to support what you guys are doing. And it just couldn't, I couldn't be more surprised or delighted. <laughs> by it. I just, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I just looked at my notes. September 22nd is going to be the uh, gravel grinder uh, route for the Tiger Town um, for cool. their Oktoberfest. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a gracious community of cyclists that that I mean, and what? they spread the word. I know, like from from our experience, like when you're out on the road, you're traveling, you're you know, dehydrated, you're hungry, you're tired, and you see like the least bit of like uh, hospitality directed in your in your direction you're like so grateful and it yeah. like kind of burns itself into your 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 memory and you just want to mm -hmm. it kind of makes you want to give back to you know that place or or those people so yeah well that certainly is Our experience yeah that's borne itself out time and time again um we had a, a guy that was on the trans america race the trans america race is also a really big thing for us um we're open for 24 hours a day for three or four days during the start of the Trans America uh, race, and we had a guy that did the race this last year. He called us up and he said, um, "My wife and I want to book uh, our air our airplane tickets because we're going to come back to Mitchell to help during the Trans America." You oh. know, I mean, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, they want to travel, you know, across the country just to come to a town of 125 people be a part of something yeah you know i mean so it took me over with the other yeah so let's talk a little bit about uh, the trans america race um so that that starts and then you guys are just like busy 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 for for a solid like three or four, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's crazy it's, it's crazy. 72 hours of adrenaline and we're not on a bike uh. so. <laughs> we uh it's funny because here at mitchell we have a an, an international dorm we have a dorm with international students. And uh, so the students this last year, they came down during, and so during the night, they're receiving bicyclists off the road. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're from Germany and Japan and China and Thailand and, you know, all over the world. And, uh, you know, I said, okay, here's the thing. 
when a cyclist comes in, they're just going to be completely intense. They can't hear what you're saying. They need food. So <laughs> we have, so we've got pasta, we've got water. Uh, people donate all sorts of snacks and things so that when a, a cyclist comes in off the Trans Am from, from the race, they've got a bed, they've got pasta, um, water, you can charge your devices. Um, there's a whole bunch of snacks that you can take with you. It's all on donation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so these students are receiving the cyclists off the road. And I said, okay, so they're going to roll in and they're going to say, I need some food, some water, and a place to sleep. Do you have that? And, <laughs> and you can say directly to their face, we've got pasta, water, and a place to sleep. And they'll go, okay, but I need some food, some <laughs> water. <laughs> so it's just this intense, you know, uh, 72 hours, but it is so much fun. It's a blast. It is fun. So what do, uh, so do people overnight there? Like how long do they sleep for? Or do a lot of people just keep rolling through or? Well, the first year we didn't know anyone was coming. And so that was kind of crazy. We were like, what? We didn't know about this. And so we just started bringing people in. Um, we found people sleeping in our stairwells outside of the building. Um, and we just bring them in and feed them whatever I had. I was like going around door to door in town, finding sugar and Kool-Aid just so I had something to give them, wow. you know? Um, so last year I said, we're going to be ready. Yep. This year we're ready. We kind of put it out there with the racers and said, if, just stop here. If you just need something to eat, go to the bathroom, have a shower, yeah. a nap, whatever. Yeah. Some people would sleep. They'd say, they'd get here and they'd eat and they'd say, I want to sleep two hours. Wake <laughs> me up. So um, we would do that. But we had, the first year, we had about 70 people. Mm, 50, 50, 50 people. people. Last year was like 150. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we were, I mean, that's a little exaggeration, but it doubled and we, we weren't ready for that either. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we thought we were ready, but then about halfway through, <clears throat> um, you know, we called uh, over to Prineville and said, uh, if there's anyone coming this way, bring pasta and pasta sauce, please. Yeah. <laughs> Company sent Kristen out here with like cases of spaghetti and spaghetti sauce yeah, and right. cook and bananas. And bananas and all that. So um, some people will stay. Some people, unfortunately, have to end their race here, whether it's an injury or a catastrophic bike failure or something. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really great place to do that, too, because you're supported. It's not like you're just hanging out there on the side of the road. So yeah. that, that gave us a whole new um perspective really a whole new perspective yeah. and a whole new ability to show hospitality in a different level you yeah because we had i think we had seven cyclists uh drop out here at spoken because of the majority of them was uh achilles um you know they were just used to pedaling flat ground mm -hmm. and racing on flat ground and there are several mountain passes between us and astoria mm -hmm. and and people just weren't ready for that and um and it's it's hard to see people have to drop out here. Mm -hmm. and, it's you know, heart wrenching. It is heart wrenching, <laughs> but I I mean it's nice because at least they're dropping out in a place where you know they can just kind of sit and think about it, and people can come get them. They're not out in the middle of nowhere with an right. injury. They have other cyclists that are supporting them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they've got other racers that are coming along and saying, "Hey, I get it." you know, don't give up on yourself. Mm -hmm. Just got to end this race. So it's a good space for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to see. That's for sure. So we talked a little bit about this off camera, but you said there might be volunteer opportunities during that window if people want to come and help, help support the writers or. There are always opportunities. <laughs> <to volunteer. laughs> um, but yeah, since it has grown so much, it, it really can't be handled by Pat and I anymore. And so we need probably a group of at least 10 people over the three days that can just stay with us, uh, take shift work, um, mm -hmm. boil spaghetti <laughs> and clean off the road, just hand water out even, right. uh, change beds, that whole kind of thing. So in the past, what we've done is we've just said, we'll feed you it and give you a place to sleep. And we need volunteers. So. Yeah, we have uh, up at our house. We have a little apartment that has that can sleep about six people, um, and it's got a shower and you know and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's a place for people to go and get some rest and then come back. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if we had about ten people that could do shift work to to uh, give us a little bit of a reprieve, that would be fantastic. Um, 
and that and also you know looking into the year ahead too um you know we believe that spoken this particular model is probably really important for a lot of other communities along the transamerica mm-hmm. and or in places where there are bike destinations um it's been good for our church it's been good for us and it's been good for our community mm-hmm. um and you know we're kind of we're at that point we're on our third year that if somebody's really interested in doing something like this, um, we would love to train people, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we're also looking for interns to help through the summer and, Mm -hmm. you know, take people to painted Hills, help change beds, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, those intern positions, while they don't pay a lot, you know, you also don't spend a lot. And <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to hang out at the mall all day. Yeah, right. not, not <laughs> but I mean, we've had, um, we've had three or four interns. The, they stay with us up at uh, this apartment that we have. And, um, and, you know, at the end of their couple months or something like that, it's, it's been an amazing experience for them too. A couple of them have gone on to hospitality training. Uh, one's in Switzerland right now at a hospitality school, um, you know, and they, she wants to open her own inn. And it's just, um, it's a great experience. And like I said, it doesn't pay well, but it is, it's pretty amazing. And the workload is not. You can usually be done in three or four hours. Yeah. And, and then so. you get to go explore Eastern Oregon, which right. is pretty cool. <laughs> cool. Well, I think on the, that note, I think I'll wrap up this episode. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video and uh, be sure to check the uh, description below for more information about volunteer opportunities at Spoken Hostel, the upcoming Gravel Grinder, uh, Grinder Hosen event at the local uh, brewery. <laughs> and thank you so much, uh, Jalay and Pat, for uh, joining us today. And I wish you guys the best of luck and I hope to make it out there again in 2018. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Russ. Okay.